Our scripture lesson for today comes from Luke's Gospel. Hear the words of God that are spoken to God's people. On another Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and taught, and there was a man there whose right hand was withered. The scribes and the Pharisees watched him to see whether he would cure on the Sabbath so that they might find an accusation against him. Even though he knew what they were thinking, he said to the man who had the withered hand, Come and stand here. He got up and stood there. Then Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to destroy it? After looking around at all of them, he said to him, stretch out your hand. He did so, and his hand was restored. But they were filled with fury and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. Let us pray. God, open our ears to hear your word. Open our hearts to receive your word. Open our eyes to see your hand at work in the world around us. And open our lives to the infinite possibilities born of your love. Amen. This lesson that we hear today from Luke's Gospel, this account of Jesus healing the man with the withered hand, is actually recounted in three of our Gospels. It's recounted in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. There are some variations, of course, because each of the Gospel writers tell us something a little bit different about this encounter in the synagogue. But the gist of the story and the characters that we meet are the same in each one of the accounts. We meet the Pharisees, the enforcers, the keepers of the law, who have all the answers and want everyone to know that they have all the answers. We meet this unnamed man with the withered hand who has come to the synagogue that day. And then there is Jesus in the midst of all of the fray. Jesus the healer. Now we know that the Pharisees must understand something about Jesus being a healer because they are busy watching him to see what he will do when he encounters this man. Note what they're not paying attention to. They're not paying attention to the man with the withered hand. But they're paying close attention to Jesus to see what Jesus will do. And we can almost imagine them standing upright and tall and without need of any scroll being able to say, Six days shall you labor, but the seventh day you shall rest and keep holy as a Sabbath to God. Because we've got Jesus in a trap, right? Jesus has been going around healing, and so surely Jesus has now come into the synagogue, and he's going to do exactly that. He's going to heal, and he's going to be breaking the commandments. So we need to watch him. We need to know what he's up to, because he's about to commit a sin. And we see this all unfolding, and immediately we start thinking to ourselves, what's up with the Pharisees? Like, what's up with these guys? They're always walking around trying to figure out what Jesus is doing wrong. Why are their hearts so hard? Why are their hearts so hard? But for a moment here, I really want us to think about something else. 
I want us to focus on something else. Because I want us to focus on this man with the withered hand for a few minutes. So we don't know anything about him other than about his infirmity. We gather this is some kind of palsy, some kind of paralysis that has not given him full use of his hand. And we know that in an agrarian culture like ancient Galilee, not having full use of both of his hands probably means that his ability to earn a living, to provide for himself and a family, may be impaired. We don't know if he's a regular at the synagogue, if this is the place where he regularly would come to hear the word. And maybe the Pharisees know him because he's a regular at the synagogue. But this could be the first time that he's wandered in. Let's put that into our context. The first time that we walk in to a faith community. And instead of the folks who are regulars there greeting us with love and compassion, they're greeting us with grumbling. We have to imagine that he's pretty glad to see Jesus. He may have come there hoping to find Jesus. He may have been wandering all over the place thinking that if I could just find Jesus, Jesus will help me. He's pretty glad to see Jesus, we can imagine. He's pretty glad for that genuine encounter with the living God. But what is he thinking as he's watching all of this drama unfold? What is he thinking about the community of faith? What is he thinking? Is he thinking that this is a welcoming place? Is he thinking that this is a place where he is loved and a place where someone is caring for him? Because it seems like somebody's trying to stand in between him and Jesus. Seems like someone's trying to stand in between him and healing. Seems like someone's trying to stand in the way of his encounter with God. And we have to own while we're sitting in this place this day that this is a reality for a lot of people. That people enter houses of faith or other places in the community where good people are around them and they don't feel loved. They don't feel welcomed. They don't feel appreciated or wanted. And they do feel that someone is standing between them and a genuine encounter with the living God. So it shouldn't surprise us all that much if you believe statistics, and if, particularly if you follow Pew Research and, and know anything at all about all of their research around religion and religion in the United States. It shouldn't surprise anyone that the number of people who claim to regularly attend worship is decreasing, while the number of people who claim not to have a religious affiliation at all is increasing. Because if we go where the good people are, if we go where the holy people are, and they're too busy enforcing to be worried about what's going on with us when we're suffering, when we're sick, when we're lost, when we're homeless, when we're undereducated, when we're underemployed, when we are forgotten. If the faith community isn't paying attention to us and is too busy being an enforcer, there's not a whole lot of reason to come back. So why are these words particularly meaningful to us as we are embarking on this 
Holy Week journey. As we're about to, we're days away from stepping into Holy Week and walking with Jesus through that week and walking through the pain and the disappointment and the hurt and the rejection and the suffering and the agony that our Lord knew. He knew that because the good people, the holy people, the law-abiding, enforcing kind of people failed to stand with God and chose to stand with the world instead. And so now we are at that place. We are at that place where we are called to ask ourselves, who are we? What do we stand for? Are we helping to invite people into relationship with God? Are we helping to facilitate that encounter with the living God which so many people are longing to have? Or are we being impediments? Are we blocking the way? Are people feeling less than loved and less than welcome? because we've gotten too busy in our own stuff to realize their needs. We are called to do and be something else. Because we are called to be the ones who help welcome all of God's people to God's table. We are called to be the ones who pave that path for all of God's people to know that genuine, loving encounter with God. We need to be very quick, very quick, as Thomas Merton says, not to condemn those whose faith is challenged. Because if what they've seen in the house of faith is our own inattention and our own selfishness and our own need to enforce We are the things that keep our own sisters and brothers from being able to find God. We pray as we enter this Holy Week journey with Jesus that we learn from his suffering, that we learn from what he knew on our behalf. And that we pray for strength to grow, to love, to be instruments of God's peace, to help all of God's people come within God's loving embrace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace.